The Orphans of Simitra. Chapter 9. Porphyrus the expert. Three months had gone by. Both Porphyrus and Mina had made many discoveries. First, they had learned that as Greece is the country of sunshine, so in Holland, in the sky, on the earth, in the air you breathe, in the clothes you wear. You know, said Mina, Holland is just like one of those sponges from Corfu soaked in a stream. She added if only it were laughing water. By laughing water she meant the water from lively springs, bubbling among rocks and dashing over waterfalls in cascades. They had learned something else Dutch was no longer incomprehensible jargon for them. Its words had meaning they could understand and make themselves understood. Porphyrus, gifted with an astonished memory, could now hold long conversations with his friend Pete Van Hulen, while Mina was content to listen to Johanna. Pete had taken the young Greeks to explore this curious land, where people are gay in spite of having no son, where everything is so hygienic that cows' tails are tied up to the roofs of the cow sheets, where horses have curtains at the windows of their stables, where everyone eats pounds of butter and one knows the taste of olive oil, where no one has ever heard a grasshopper, yet everyone can imitate the sound on a guitar, where everyone, from the humblest stevedore to the queen mother herself, goes about on a bicycle even including fat Mrs. Van. Hulen, with her pale eyes and hair the color of mace. And since everyone in Holland goes about on a bicycle, that was how Porphyrus and Mina, together with Pete and Johanna, went to school each morning. School was an important part of their new life. Every morning, as they arrived, they had to take their shoes off, for the school, too, was highly polished. At school, Dutch children learned to sweep and dust and clean, to polish with oil and beeswax and elbow grease. Mina and Porphyrus did not lose their footing anymore. Indeed, Porphyrus was expert now in the art of sliding all around the room like a skater, one foot lifted behind him, without knocking into a single piece of furniture. They liked their school, even though discipline was far more severe than anything they had known in Greece. The main thing was they had very quickly learned that it is as easy to understand blue eyes as dark ones. They stopped being gypsies to be looked at as cats, to whom no one would lend a handkerchief for fear it would not be returned. On the register they were simply Mina and Porphyrus, as the others were Pete, Johanna, Kaors, or Maria. Their teacher, the tall young girl fresh as a tulip from Marken, obviously liked her new pupils, with just a slight reservation perhaps in the case of Porphyrus, whom she found intelligent but a little temperamental. How could this tall young girl possibly understand that Porphyrus would never be quite like the others? Sometimes he spoke his thoughts aloud, or suddenly went out without asking permission, to pick a narcissus in the garden, or, if he felt that his foot had been imprisoned too long, he would take off his sock and wriggle his toes about, as if it were the most natural thing in the world. The teacher often found drawings in his exercise books, and nearly always the same ones small red rectangles and microscopic people, equally red. And these, what are they meant to be? The blonde young woman asked him one day, as if it wasn't obvious. Gasoline pumps, miss. Why do you draw them all the time? Porphyrus got up from his seat, his dark eyes glowing with enthusiasm. Miss, we had a garage in Ecruz, on the road to Janina, the big Betrogos service station. I was in charge of the gasoline pump. I served foreigners who were on their way to Athens to see the part anon. I had a red uniform, as red, red as, as, his eyes swept the classroom. The sort of red you don't have in Holland and Mina and my mother and everyone thought I looked very fine. The teacher smiled and left him to his drawings, sure that he would soon grow tired of them. But she was wrong. In spite of all his troubles, and the grey skies of Holland, Porphyrus had lost nothing of his normal zest. The dream he had cherished for so long had not died. Nearly every afternoon, as they came out of school, and Mina set off home with Johanna, Porphyrus would say to Pete shall we go? He did not have to finish Pete knew what he meant. Pedaling like mad, they shot off along the straight road, raised like a dike and edged with meadows, that led to a village called Kruinan, with not many more houses than Symmetra before the earthquake. But how could they be compared? There was not a single muck heap to be seen at Kruinan, not a chicken or a duck in the streets, no black pigs like those you always saw at Symmetra, and no grapes or figs drying on the terraces. Only houses so neat they looked as if they had been put there the day before.
each one wearing a bouquet of flowers in the buttonhole of its white painted windows. Right in the middle of the village, there was a single garage. It was a modest little place, with nothing ostentation about it. There were not many cars on the Gutheran Peninsula that Porphyrus had taken for an island on his arrival, since most stock breeders preferred horses to motors. The garage undertook repairs mainly for agricultural machines and tractors. There was no dazzling scarlet gasoline pump as at Janina, only a small hand pump, and quite often the drums were simply emptied straight into the tanks. In spite of this slight drawback, Porphyrus could not resist dragging his friend Pete to Crudinan nearly every evening, though it must be said that Pete was not altogether unwilling. Porphyrus always talked about all the things he was interested in with such enthusiasm that he would have converted stones. The owner of the garage, much amused at the way the young Greek's eyes missed nothing, gave them the freedom of his workshop. Porphyrus. He would call out, rolling the R's terrifically. Clean up these grease spots for me, will you? Porphyrus would grab a rag and start rubbing away. In Holland, people who know how to polish properly are very highly esteemed and Porphyrus soon won the respect of his boss, as he called him. Soon he was allowed to blow up a tire, or tighten the nut, in addition to his normal job of cleaning up patches of grease and oil. He was even called upon to handle gasoline. Emptying cans into a tractor was obviously nothing like filling up an expensive car, but the smell of the gasoline was almost the same, only not quite so strong as in Greece, where the sun gives strength to colors and smells. Above all, Porphyrus felt completely at home in the garage, so much so that he thought the matron at Timaza was right. I'm nearly grown up now. Selling gas is great fun, but I ought to know something about mechanics as well. We find his boss was repairing an engine. He hung around and insisted on wiping up every drop of oil that fell so that he could watch every move. One day the peasant from the Gutheran water meadow brought in an enormous tractor. It was towed in by a horse since the engine would not go. Every time an attempt was made to get it on the road again, the engine coughed, snorted, trembled, sneathed, hiccuped, and finally stopped with a prolonged sigh. Porphyrus and Pete gave their whole attention to the examination of the motor. But the proteator, in spite of all his skill and experience, could not find the reason for this abnormal behavior on the part of a machine that was nearly new. Whatever he tried, the engine snorted, trembled, and passed out with the same sigh. The next day the tractor was still here, in front of the door. The proprietor, on the other hand, seemed to be absent. You're an expert, Porphyrus said Pete, meaning it. You know what's wrong, don't you? Porphyrus had not the slightest idea, but he felt that it would be an extremely poor taste for the son of a former garage owner to admit his ignorance. That's where the trouble is he said, pointing to the engine, and shrugging his shoulders. You think so? Practically certain? He had not pointed at anything specifically, and his practically certain did not sound very convincing. Pete, however, was tremendously impressed with his knowledge. Well, then, since you know, why don't you try blood rush to Porphyrus' head? Pete had just said the forbidden word. With one bound, Porphyrus leaped upon the enormous machine like someone climbing to the attack, and settled himself in the seat. He could now look down upon Pete from a height of more than six feet. The least he could do, now that he was up there, was to ease the knowledgeable eye over all the incredible array of tubes, gears, levers, and knobs. That's where the trouble island he said for the second time, and because he felt he must be more precise, he pulled down one of the levers with all his strength. Pete only just had time to throw himself out of the path of the juggernaut. Without warning, the tractor took off. With a succession of banks and jerks like the back kick of a zebra starlet by cannon shot. Porphyrus was nearly thrown from his seat, but managed by some miracle to hang on. So, there he was, lumbering off into the streets of Crunan on the back of his monster machine, leaving behind him a flabbergasted Pete chalking in a cloud of smoke. Ah! Leave Emily! What a ride! Terrified, Porphyrus could only try to steer a straight course and avoid running anyone over. As it was, knocked the vicar's bicycle down as it stood beside the curb, and squashed the basket of vegetables left behind by the frightened grocer. Icy sweat was running down his face. At last he came out on the long, straight highway, where he could make some effort to stop his mount. What a hope! He put his foot down on a pedal that could easily have been a brake, 
and the tractor raced along ever faster. Turning the wheel this way and that, he just managed to keep on the road. What if he met a herd of cattle? And what was this small village drawing near? It was his own. He would be going past his own door. And after that? Yes, that was the point. He reviewed the position rapidly. Let's see going out of the village a road turned right, it would bring him back again. There you are, the circuits all worked out. He started on his crazy circular tour twice, three times, he went through the village. Porphyrus. Porphyrus. That was my calling, but he had no time to waste. Another turn to the right, and he was on his fourth lap. Again he tried, moving the first lever that came to hand, but the tractor was determined to pay no attention. Poor Porphyrus began thinking of the dike, and how it led straight to the sea. This infernal machine would be forced to stop in the water, and he could just throw himself into the sea. No, a captain must either save his ship or die on board. But he could not keep going around in circles. It was dusk, and soon his path would be filled with cattle returning home. Well, there was nothing else to do, so off he set for Kruinan again. Turning the wheel so abruptly that he nearly flung himself into the fine bale, he got into a straight line once more. This time, it was as though the tractor sensed a garage, as a horse senses in stable. Porphyrus, only a moment ago red in the face with all his exertions, now grew pale. He had a feeling that he was coming into danger. Here was the bridge over to lock the windmill the big farm the village was drawing rapidly nearer it was there. The tractor, overheated by this long escapade, seemed to have wings. It swooped down upon the main street, regardless of passers-by, they must get out of the way as best they could. Calamity. At the far end of the marketplace a herd of cows came into view. Ten, twenty, thirty cows. Porphyrus gave himself up for the lost. He was faced with terrible alternatives either he must plunge straight into the herd and massacre the poor beast, or dash himself to pieces against a wall with his machine. He had shut his eyes tight to avoid seeing what happened, when his mount suddenly bucked, coughed, snorted, and stopped, having run out of fuel about a yard from a terrified cow. The villagers came running, crowding around the young boy, and among them he saw his boss. Within seconds Porphyrus had recovered his normal composure. I was only trying it out he said, I knew the trouble was in the end it's going fine now it's a very good tractor well, I must be of now. With never a backward look, he went off with his friend Pete, who would never know if Porphyrus really did have a special knowledge of mechanics, or how much he had suffered on that nightmare ride.